My name is Hussein Hashemi, as was said. I got my undergrad degree many years ago from Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, Iran. And I got a master's of science in the same institution two years later. Then I uh, moved to the U.S. and I got my Ph.D. from Caltech in 2003. And I immediately joined the faculty of USC as a first assistant professor, then associate professor, and now a full professor of electrical and computer engineering. I work on two different research topics. The first one is radio frequency integrated circuits for wireless communications which is the topic of the talk today. And the second part is silicon photonics integrated circuits for LiDAR imaging and optical computing, which is the talk that the next speaker is going to give you. And uh, I have uh, been interested in starting companies. I've started a company uh, several years ago, and that company was acquired later on. And that was about radio frequency systems. Um, with that said, we're going to talk about RF systems. Uh, before I start, uh, I should say that the assumption that I have is that uh, an audience, a typical person, is a sophomore of electrical engineering. So I am not assuming that you know a whole lot, which means that if you know a whole lot, some of the slides may be trivial for you. So in that case, then just be happy. And uh, that's the disclaimer. So first things first, what are electromagnetic waves? So electromagnetic waves are solutions to Maxwell equations. Some of you may have had electromagnetics in your courses, and some of you may have not. It's perfectly OK. But basically, all of the electromagnetic waves consist of two components, electric waves and magnetic waves. Electric waves are associated with things such as maybe voltages, for instance, and magnetic fields are maybe related to some things like current, okay? And in the picture that I'm showing down there, it's a specific example of an electromagnetic wave where the electric field is shown in red and the magnetic field is shown in blue. So what you can see is that in this picture, electric field and magnetic field are perpendicular to each other. So if one of them, the field is moving up down, the other one is moving from side to side. And they both propagate, so they both move forward. The arrow that you see is a direction of propagation. Now, electromagnetic waves has this wonderful property that they can propagate everywhere. They can propagate in free space, so that's how we communicate. They can even propagate through solids, so they can penetrate through the material. That's why your cell phones work when, even when you're inside a building. And they can work through liquids, too. All right. The most important property of electromagnetic waves is that they propagate with the speed of light. All right, so all electromagnetic waves in the world travel at the same speed, so long as they are in free space. If you go inside of a material, so let's say that now you're in the water, the waves are going to slow down, all right? We all remember from our high school physics that speed of light is the highest speed, right? So we cannot go above that, we can only go below that. So the highest speed is the speed in the free space, and anything lower than that is in other material. Again, from basic high school physics, we know that speed is equal to distance divided by time. Therefore, time is equal to distance over speed. Therefore, you can easily find the delay, how long it takes for the electromagnetic wave to travel from point A to point B. That's quite straightforward. Now, here I'm giving you some typical scenarios of wireless systems so that we get a feel of the numbers. As an example, take your AirBots, the ones that you connect and you know, listen to music when you jog around. And let's assume that your cell phone is somewhere within two meters of you. In that case, the delay is about six nanoseconds. Nano is 10 to the minus nine. All right, so it's a very, very small delay. You won't even notice it. A typical cell phone that you hold in your hand 
has a distance of up to, let's say, a kilometer to the base station that is somewhere in the street. In that case, the delay becomes microseconds, all right, which is 10 to the minus 6. Now, let's say that we want to have a communication from here to the International Space Center that is 400 kilometers away from the Earth. In that case, the delay becomes milliseconds, 10 to the minus 3. And we're trying to colonize Mars, I've been told. So we're sending humans there, and at some point we need to communicate with them. So in that case, the delay is going to be five minutes. So it's not going to be a very fun conversation. You say something, you have to wait five minutes for the other person to acknowledge five minutes and then get it back to you. So that's a 10 minute round trip delay. But these are the kind of numbers you want to keep in mind, right? Now, in most of the electromagnetic waves, the wave changes in a sinusoidal way. It doesn't have to. You can send waves that look like a pulse. But in many cases, like the picture that I showed you two slides ago, the wave changes as a sinusoid. If the wave changes as a sinusoid, then the wave is going to be periodic not only in time but also in space. What does it mean? It means that if the wave propagates in this point, at some time later it's going to show up exactly in this point. All right. So there is a pe period in the space too. And that period is defined to be as wavelength which is going to be given by speed divided by frequency. Frequency is the frequency of how fast the wave is changing, and speed we already determined is the speed of light. Okay, so that's the wavelength. It tells you how quickly the wave repeats itself in the space. Some typical examples of radio systems that you deal with on a daily basis, I think. So FM radio, if you're in your car and you're, if you're listening to a radio, then the frequency is about hundreds of megahertz, and the wavelength is three meters. It's very, very long. All right, three meters long. It's about 10 feet. Bluetooth. Most of you use Bluetooth one way or another, maybe to connect to your AirPods, etc. The frequency is 2.4 gigahertz, and the wavelength is 12 centimeters. This big. Then we go to body scanners at the airport. If you took a plane to get here, like as I did, you went to these airport scanners, they work at higher frequencies, like 30 gigahertz, and the wavelength is tinier, one centimeter, this big. And most of the fancy cars nowadays have some sort of radar in them so that they can navigate. And the wavelength of those is even less because the frequency is higher, 77 gigahertz, and the wavelength becomes something like four millimeters. All right, this wavelength actually has some interesting uh, consequences, just the fun consequences for you to know is that sometimes you've noticed that as you're speaking to the f on the phone, you don't get a very good reception. And if you give this phone to this hand and suddenly you have a very good reception. And you're always like, what just happened? And well, what happened is that as it turns out, this distance from here to here is related to the wavelength. All right, so as you travel with f maybe half a wavelength or a wavelength, things can change quite drastically, all right? Just something for fun to know. All right, so what we learned is that frequency and wavelength go in the opposite directions. As the frequency increases, the wavelength decreases. Now, electromagnetic waves are very general. They are not limited to radio frequencies. In fact, radio frequency is just a fraction of these vast possibilities that electromagnetic waves offer. Very, very roughly speaking, radio frequencies are the frequencies that are maybe below around 10 to the 12 hertz. All right, this is very, very loose. Depending on who you talk to, people can have different boundaries. All right, so the wavelength is going to be less than 10 to the minus 4 meters. All right, fraction of a millimeter. So that's radio frequencies. And this includes RF, it includes microwave, it includes millimeter wave. So all of this, we're going to bundle it into radio frequencies. Frequencies that are above this are going to be optical frequencies, including the ones that you see, visible wavelengths, including infrared, the ones you don't see, including UV light, even higher frequencies. And you can see things that are higher frequency have a much, much shorter wavelength, right? And if you go even frequencies higher than that, you get x-rays.
So what is the meaning of this? When you go to higher and higher frequencies to optical and X-ray, because the wavelength is smaller, resolution becomes better. So that's why you can see very, things very, very pretty. That's why X-ray scanners work really, really well. All right. On the downside, because the wavelength is really, really small, the wave doesn't penetrate through objects that easily. So that's why you don't see behind the wall. I don't think you see. I can't. And if you work with radio frequencies, though, I can design a radio frequency radar that can see behind this wall. Because the wavelengths are longer, they can propagate through the wall as well. All right, so that's one consequence of going with radio frequencies. Now, I'm sure that in this room you all acknowledge the vast capabilities that radio frequencies offer from an application standpoint. I'm not going to poll you because I highly doubt if anybody doesn't have a cell phone. So that's taken. Everybody has a cell phone and all of your cell phones have a Wi-Fi in them. They have Bluetooth in them and they have GPS. So the first four icons are already covered in one small phone. So your phone already has four radio frequency systems inside of it, right? Beyond that, we have radio frequency identification that you might have seen them in stores, or sometimes you might have these key fobs that you open a door. So those are based on radio frequency identification. Uh, satellite communication is a big one. Some of you may have dishes at home for listening to, or for seeing some radio sta uh, some TV stations. And you might have heard of some companies that are selling satellite communication products right now for fast connectivity to internet, right? Starlink is making a big noise, right? Uh, we already covered cars. Cars nowadays have radar so that they can help you navigate and maybe in the future they can drive themselves because by radar you can detect the distances. Uh, you can, there is a lot of healthcare uh, applications for radio frequency systems in addition to the ones that you heard in the lecture before. So these are, for instance, things such as MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, has to use radio frequency fields. You can use radio frequency fields to image what's inside of the body or even for curing purposes. So you can kill maybe bad cells, cancerous cells using focused radio frequency fields. All right. Uh, you can, uh, satellites, and radio frequencies are always used to monitor what's happening in the Earth. So that's why, uh, that's how the weather prediction works, right? Whether it's good or bad, they tell you how it's going to rain. These are all based on radio frequency radars that can predict, okay, these are the clouds. This is what's happening on the Earth. This is the ocean status. This is all done through that. Probably a very big application of radio frequency is in the military. Uh, radio frequency radars and communication systems are used in virtually every military system that you can imagine. And the last one is the radio frequency scanners, which is actually quite helpful because without that, then we will have to all go to the body search, pat down, which is not fun, right? Okay. Now let's get a little bit more technical. All right. The idea of wireless communication is that I want to send information from point A to point B. So I want to convey my information to you and you're not here, you're somewhere else. So what I should do is to take in information and find a way to send it to you. We already said that the way to do this is by putting it on an electromagnetic wave because electromagnetic waves are the ones that travel, right? With what? With speed of light. So the goal is to put the information on an electromagnetic signal and let it travel with the speed of light. That process is called modulation. All right. So the process of putting the information on an electromagnetic signal for it to travel, we're going to call it modulation. In here, I'm showing the electromagnetic signal with a term that is common in RF systems. We call it a carrier. And the reason it's called a carrier is because it's something that carries the information with it. Okay? And I'm showing it with a cosine that has a frequency. That frequency is a frequency of the electromagnetic wave. So, for instance, in Bluetooth, that is 2.4 gigahertz. 
2.4, 10 to the 9 hertz. Okay? So, when you have a cosine, and if you want to put information on the cosine, there are only two things you can do. You can either change the amplitude of the cosine, or you can change the phase of the cosine. So that information x of t has to appear either in the amplitude of the cosine or the phase. And depending on where it shows up, we're going to give it different names. If it shows up in the amplitude of the cosine, we're going to call this amplitude modulation or AM. Maybe you have heard of the term AM radio, right? And if it shows up in the phase, it is going to be called phase modulation or PM. And there is at least one of you right now who is wondering, so what's up with FM? I'm also, I've also heard of FM, frequency modulation. Well, frequency modulation, you can think about it as sort of a variation of the phase modulation because frequency is a derivative of phase. Okay, so they're both the same thing. And in the general case, in fact, in modern systems, we put the information both in amplitude and in phase. So it's AM, PM combined. All right. Oh, and by the way, Things are digital these days. So both of these are digital signals. So I send you this electromagnetic wave. What is your job as a receiver? To decode what I just sent to you. So I sent you a cosine with an amplitude and a phase. Your job is to extract the information from that amplitude and phase. And that process is called demodulation. So basically, on the transmit side, I have to perform modulation. On the receive side, you would have to perform demodulation. Now, naturally, if you want to extract the information from the carrier, it is a good idea to know what that carrier is. There are ways that you can extract the carrier information, but if you knew it in advance, it would help a lot. If you knew that, okay, you are sending me 2.4 gigahertz signal, then I can just look for the amplitude of that one signal, right? So life would be easier. That's why I'm showing down there that even the demodulator is benefiting from the knowledge of that carrier signal at electromagnetic wave frequency. Okay. So this is an RF system. And we can go home all because we're done. <laughs> Put information on a modulator, set it with an antenna. That's your transmitter. On the receiver, get an antenna, demodulate it, get back the information. That's it. That's it. I promise you that's it. For the rest of the lectures, I'll show you a little bit of what goes inside of it, right? Not much. That's it. Okay. So let's talk about first the modulator part of it, all right? So now I want to put my information as the amplitude and the phase of an electromagnetic signal. So what do I do? Don't... Uh, get nervous about this complicated looking diagram. It's not that bad. You'll see why not. On the left hand side in green, you show that I'm showing two things, I of T and Q of T. Think of them as your information. Okay, so you're talking or you want to upload a JPEG. Your JPEG is I of T or Q of T. Just think about it that way. That's it. All right. Then you go to a block, and the block job is to multiply two signals. All right, now you may wonder, how am I supposed to multiply two signals? All right, we can see later. Let's suppose you can do that. Multiply two by four, we know how to do it in our head. So we can probably design a circuit that does that too. So you multiply the signal. So I of t gets multiplied by cosine, and Q of t gets multiplied by sine. And I have a typo run down there, because that should be sine of omega t. All right? So you get I of T cosine plus Q of T sine. Now, some of you might remember from your mathematics that if I have a cosine and a sine and I add them up, I get a new cosine that has an amplitude and a phase. Do you guys remember? You're nodding your head. Good. So you can see that I can actually get the amplitude and phase information by this simple operation. So all I need to do is to multiply my signals one by sine, one by cosine, and add them up. Now, believe it or not, this simple scheme is a scheme that is used in a vast majority of radio frequency transmitters. 
So you open up your phone, those four radios, a good chance they're just using that. So right there, you should feel very good about yourselves. On the receiver, I'm going to do exactly the opposite. So first things first, antenna receives a signal. I'm showing a block that I'll cover a little bit more later on and call the bandpass filter. The job of that block is to say that, all right, you are receiving Bluetooth signal. Please reject the TV stations because I'm not interested in listening to TV anymore, right? So you want to get rid of all the bad guys that you don't want. Bad as in things you don't want. After that, the signals are tiny, so you need to amplify them. That's your low-dose amplifier. You suck amplifiers in the previous lecture too, right? Similar concept, more or less. Amplifiers, and they should be low noise. You saw how bad noise is. So, And then you perform the same process. You multiply the signal once by a cosine and one by the sine. I will let this to be an exercise for you. To multiply this signal at the bottom, I of t cosine plus Q of t sine by a cosine and see what the output is. Do that and you will see that magically I of t shows up at the output. And all you need to use is that sine times sine of x times cosine of x is sine of 2x and cosine of 2x is 2 cosine squared of x minus 1. So that's all you need to know. All right, I'll give you a hint too. So basically, this scheme is going to give you the information in the receiver. Now, this one I can even make a stronger statement. I think all the wireless systems that you're using use this scheme. All right. Okay, there are a little bit details over here and there, but this is pretty much it. So you go to this conference, you see all these fancy papers. They're all this block diagram. Okay. Now we want to build some of these circuits, right? This is a circuits group. I hope that you all like circuits. That's why you're here. All right. Resistors. We all know what resistors are, right? So a resistor is a two-terminal device that can relate voltage and current by a constant factor that is called resistance, right? So if the voltage is a sinusoid, the current is a sinusoid with the same phase that it just scaled by resistivity. Sounds good? In radio frequency systems, we care a lot about power. Power is always voltage times current. So you multiply voltage by current in the resistor, and you get sine squared, which is always positive. So you can see in the red that the power in the resistor is always positive, which means that resistors always consume power at all times. Okay, they can never generate power. Interesting. And then if you take the average of that graph, you get to the very important equation that is shown at the very end. The average power of a resistor is V squared over 2R. Okay, on the average resistor consumes that much power. And I emphasize on the average because you can see on the red graph that sometimes it doesn't consume any power and sometimes consumes a lot more. But on the average, that's the number. We'll get back to this number later on. All right? Okay, this was for the resistors. Capacitors. Capacitor is another two-terminal component where the current is proportional to the derivative of the voltage. Okay? So this time, if I start with the sinusoid for my voltage, I'm going to get a cosine for my current. So there is a phase shift between voltage and current. And if I calculate the power, if I multiply sine by cosine, I will get sine of x times cosine of x. I just told you sine of x times cosine of x is sine of 2x. So you get the graph at the bottom. And you can see capacitor has this interesting property that sometimes it takes power. Power is positive. Sometimes power is negative, which means that it gives power. Okay, so in a cycle, half of the cycle is taking power, half of the cycle is giving power. And on the average, the power is what? Zero. It consumes no power. That's why we call capacitors a lossless component. Fantastic. Now, because the capacitor current lags the voltage by 90 degrees, we can think of a capacitor as a resistor whose resistance is given by that equation, 1 over j omega c. 
j is square root of minus 1, a complex number, right? All it says is that the voltage and current have 90 degrees of phase difference. And that 1 over omega c comes from the ratio of i of t and v of t. If you divide, it by, divide v of t by i of t, you see 1 over c omega. Okay? And we call that an equivalent impedance of a capacitor. So when we analyze circuits from now on, as long as my inputs are sinusoidal, I'll remove a capacitor, I put a resistor with that value in it, 1 over j omega c. We're going to play this game in a couple of slides from now. Inductors are the opposite of capacitors. The voltage is derivative of current. All right, so capacitor, current was the derivative of voltage. Inductors, voltage is the derivative of current, which means that if I start with a sine for the voltage, current is going to be minus cosine. So this time, the current is 90 degrees ahead. But power, just as before, is going to be zero on the average. Inductors are also lossless components. The impedance of an inductor, it is j omega l. So for capacitor was 1 over j omega c. For inductor, it's j omega l. We're going to just play with these a little bit more moving forward. The last thing I wanted to say before I get to the uh, actual RF designs is the concept of steady state sinusoidal analysis. So here's an example. You have an R and C in a circuit with a voltage at the input, V in. Just look at the top left graph. And I'm interested to finding what the output is. Okay? Knowing that my input signal is a sinusoid, that's a key issue here. So the, if the input is sinusoid, then I can replace the capacitor with its impedance as I showed before, 1 over j omega c. And I'm pretty sure that all of you know how to solve resistor problems, right? So in this particular case, I have a resistor divider. So you solve this resistor divider problem, and you get V out over V in given by the top right equation that sh is shown here. So gain becomes R divided by J omega RC plus 1. All right. So a few things you notice. Gain depends on omega, which is frequency. And it is a complex value because it has J in it. Right? So plotting complex things is not fun. So instead of plotting A, let's plot just the magnitude of A. All right. The magnitude of A versus frequency looks like the graph that you see at the bottom right. So at low frequencies, when omega is low, A has a large value. As omega becomes larger, A has small value. This function is going to be called a low pass function because it passes low frequencies. Because at low frequencies, the value is high, and at high frequencies, it's low. Sounds good? Low pass function is the kind of things that you saw in the previous lecture. In fact, in the previous lecture, you also saw high pass filters, right? where, if you remember, the capacitor and resistor were swapped. Okay? So, now I'm going to have a little bit more fun, because I'm going to introduce inductors in the game. So now I'm going to add an inductor in series with the capacitor, C and L together. All right? We decided that the way to analyze it is quite straightforward. Each of them is equivalent to a resistor with its equivalent resistances. So the equivalent resistance of a capacitor was 1 over j omega c. For the inductor was j omega l. And then all I need to do is to add these two because they come in series. When I add these two, I get the expression on the top right. 1 minus lc omega squared over j omega c. I'll give you a minute to look at it to make sure that we all agree that's the expression that I get. A few things that we noticed. Let's assume that the numerator can be zero. Where, what is the condition for that to happen? It is when 1 minus LC omega squared is equal to zero, right? Or in other words, omega is equal to 1 over square root of LC. So there is a frequency that this combination gives you zero resistance. Zero resistance means what? Short circuit. Short circuit. Thank you. So you get a short circuit at one frequency. That's fantastic. And all the other frequencies, you see a large value for the Z. 
So in the bottom left, I am showing you the three cases. If omega is equal to that one over square root of LC, and by now on, we're going to call it resonance frequency, I get a short circuit. And frequencies that are far from it, I see an open circuit, right? That's cool. All right. We can play the same game by putting these two in parallel. I won't go to the details in here. Again, there is a frequency this time in which the combination looks like an open circuit. And then all the other frequencies become the short circuit. All right. These series and parallel resonances are the most fundamental concepts that you're going to encounter in RF circuit design. Okay. So remember, in series resonances, at the resonance, I get a short circuit. In parallel resonances, at resonance, I get an open circuit. Sounds good? We think we can remember this? Sounds good? All right, let's go on. So now I'm going to show you how to build a band pass filter. Let's look at the top left graph first. I put an LC, a series LC, between my input and output. OK. Remember, at resonance frequency, what happens to the series LC? Short circuit. So basically, I'm shorting my input and output, right? So input goes to the output. It passes through. Fantastic. At frequencies that are far from the resonance frequency, what happens? Open circuit, which means that output doesn't see the input. So that's why it's a bandpass filter, as you can see in the graph. It passes just the frequency. What is the frequency of the bandpass? The, the resonance frequency. Fantastic. You can build the same bandpass filter by putting an LC parallel in the bottom configuration. So in here, what happens is that once again, at the resonance frequency, parallel LC looks like an open circuit. If it's open, input and output are connected, signal goes through. At very high frequencies, the capacitor is going to short the output. At very low frequencies, inductor is going to short the output. So signal at low frequencies and at high frequencies doesn't go through. And at resonance frequency, it does go through. So I can build bandpass filter using this configuration. All right? You should feel really good about yourselves. Bandpass filters are hard, especially this guy. So now I'm telling, showing you a very complex bandpass filter. Because if I could create a resonance, why not create many of them? So now I create a lot of series and a lot of parallel resonances. And what that will do is that it will create a very sharp filter. All right? Remember in the receiver, I told you that in the beginning, I need a filter to get rid of all the things I don't like? They are all built using something like this. Just to be clear, they're not using inductors and capacitors, but the filter architecture resembles this or can resemble this. All right? This is, by the way, called a ladder filter. All right. So now we learn about filters. We want to amplify signals. We all uh, have been familiar with op amps. So why not use these op amps to amplify RF signals? Op amps were used to amplify neural signals. We might as well use them here. The reason we can't use them is that op amps don't work at high frequencies. It's as simple as that. So that's a data sheet of an op amp. It's a typical op amp. It's not a good one. It's not a bad one. It's just an op amp. And you can see that it stops at megahertz range. Radio frequency signals go up to what? Gigahertz, tens of gigahertz, hundreds of gigahertz. So the reason the op amp cannot be used is that op amps don't support gigahertz frequencies. As simple as that. Otherwise, we would definitely use them. OK. So in the absence of that, how do I amplify signals? Now, I don't know how many of you here are familiar with transistors. I'm assuming that you're not. So if you know transistors, yay. If not, perfectly OK. Think of a transistor as a component that can create a current that is proportional to a voltage. All right. That's all I need you to know at this point. So what I shown in blue here is a device. That device is called a transistor. There is a current through it, ID. 
that current is proportional to Vn. And I'm showing that in expression. Id is Gm times Vn. That's all we need to know. That current flows to a resistor, Rd. So the voltage across the Rd is I times R. We just saw that, right? So use those equations. So V out becomes Rd times Gm times V in, which means that the gain, which is V out over V in, is Gm times Rd. This, for those of you who have seen transistor schematics, it's a very popular schematic. It is called a common source amplifier. If it was using bipolar devices, this would be called common emitter amplifier. Okay, and it has a gain. So, why can I not use it for RF systems? The problem is that you always have parasitic capacitors, whether you like it or not. The transistor has parasitics, your layout has parasitics, everything has parasitics, all right? And in RF systems, capacitors, we're not a big fan of them. I know that you've heard the otherwise in the previous lecture, capacitors are kind of good to filter noise. Here, not as much. So, the problem with the capacitor now is that at high frequencies, it is going to short the signal to become zero. So V out becomes zero. In other words, the gain is going to have a low pass transfer function. That's not very good. All right. What kind of transfer function do we need for RF systems? Low pass, high pass, band pass? Anybody? Yeah. Band pass, right? We need a band pass because you're trying to pass one specific frequency, right? Maybe for Wi-Fi, maybe for FM radio, maybe for something else. So here's a question. How do you think that I can make this a bandpass amplifier? What, do, what does it need to have? What did we learn? How do we create bandpass things? Creating resonance. resonance. Thank you. We want to create a resonance. So. There you go. We can create a resonance by just having an inductor. That's it. So congratulations. You learned how to design bandpass amplifiers. This is an RF amplifier. I'm not even joking. This is a real RF amplifier. All right. RF is not hard. I told you. OK. So how do I adjust the value of the inductor? The key here is that the resonance frequency is a function of this inductor and the capacitor. OK? That's it. It's that simple. Great. We're learning so much. So if you go to this conference, everybody's going to tell you, oh god, the hardest thing in RF design to do is power amplifiers. There are tons of papers on this block. Why is that? Well, this guy is the one that is supposed to generate enough power for your signal to travel long distances. Okay, what kind of power levels we're we talking about? All right, if you talk about the Bluetooth, and this is your phone, this is your AirBot, that's only a few milliwatts. Not a big deal. Anybody can do that. Wi-Fi, okay, things are getting more serious because Wi-Fi router has to work in the house. So maybe the power is of hundreds of milliwatts. Cell phone, signal has to travel kilometers, so maybe it's half a watt to a watt. You want to go to International Space Station, power is a lot more. Okay, so power here matters. And let's see how do I amplify a signal to create power, right? A while back, I told you to remember an equation for power. It was V squared over 2R. Remember that? Good. So if I want to have high power, should the voltage be high or low? High. Resistance should be high or low? low? Low. So I need high voltage, low resistance, right? OK. Problem is that you're out of luck for the first one. Well, let's actually talk about the second one. So let's say the antenna resistance is 50 ohms. I'm giving you an example. And I'm trying to see what is the voltage level that I need to get the power levels in the applications that I have. So you can see Bluetooth is a piece of cake. One volt, good enough. Wi-Fi. OK, I need 3 volts, a bit higher. Cell phone, I need a whole lot lower, 7 volts. Problem, you're trying to design these things in state-of-the-art processes, right? 2 nanometer transistors. 2 nanometer transistors are so tiny, you put half a volt across them, 
maybe 9.9 .9 volts, they break. They have to operate at very, very low voltages. So you can't put 7 volts across them. OK, so voltage is out of the question. What is the next option? Resistance. Use low resistance. But you can't do that. Antenna resistance is given by the guy who designs the antenna. And the guy who designs the antenna is a pretty serious guy. He says that I'm not going to change my resistance. It's going to stay 50 ohm no matter what. So it's your problem. And you say, all right, let's go back to the basics of the circuits. There is this other component that I didn't know about, transformers. Yay. So transformer is this fantastic block that has two inductors that are magnetically coupled to each other. And then, as it turns out, first of all, it's lossless. No resistors, no loss. So conservation of power means that P1 plus P2 is equal to 0. I have too many typos here. Fantastic. That's P1 plus P2 is equal to 0. And it can be proved that the ratio of V1 over V2 is equal to the ratio of the windings, N1 over N2. All right? And that's inverse of the ratio of the currents. Now, it can be easily shown, and I'm sure most of you have seen it, that if I put a resistor at the secondary of the transformer, and if I find the resistor of the primary, it goes by a factor of N1 over N2 squared. So the resistance of the primary is scaled version of the resistance of the secondary. That scaling factor is N1 over N2 squared. Sounds good? But keep in mind, transformers are lossless. So if I put power in the primary, I get the same power in the secondary. So here's a trick. Antenna guy is pretty insisting on that 50 ohm. Fine. I am going to add my own transformer so that my transistor sees a smaller resistance. OK? Because my transistor sees a smaller resistance, for the same 1 volt of supply voltage, now I can generate a lot more power. OK? And I've calculated what should the transformation ratio be for these applications that we just discussed about, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and cell phone. OK? So a simple transformer solves the problem of power amplifier. Right? So why do people say it's a hard thing? We just designed it in two minutes. Well, it turns out that transformers are not very easy, realizable. All right, you need magnetic cores, things like that. You want to fit it in a small area. What can high frequency is not easy. So people come up with other techniques. We're not going to co cover them here. So there are other techniques that the transformer can be replaced with other things that act as transformers. OK? People still complain about PA being a hard problem. And if you want to know why, it's because none of these components is ideal. All right. I already told you that inductors are lossless, but that's only ideal world. That's only on paper. In practice, inductors are not lossless. Capacitors are not lossless. So the reason that power amplifiers are hard is that there are a lot of non-idealities that goes with this. OK? But yay, you learn power amplifiers. Oh, and by the way, I'm not lying. No matter how hard power amplifiers are, the schematic of 90% of what is your cell phone looks like this. I'm telling you, I'm telling you everything about you need to know about your cell phone. So you go home feeling pretty satisfied about that. All right, next block is going to be tricky, oscillators. Now, I need to create that, radio, uh, that electromagnetic signal to begin with, right? So how do I generate that? First of all, let's see what kind of frequencies we're dealing with. Bluetooth, we already said, it's 2.4 gigahertz. I think most of you knew that already. Wi-Fi has a lot of different frequencies. Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz. These fancy systems have multi-band Wi-Fi's, right? Cell phone is all over the place, man. Works from 0.8 to 1.7 to 2.2 to 3.5. Your cell phone is marvelous. Your cell phone works covers, I don't know, 30, 40 bands. OK, so many, many frequencies. Which, by the way, means that your cell phone must have a way to generate all of those frequencies. Pretty hard, right? That oscillator. OK, there is a good news. That resonance concept still comes to the rescue. If you get an inductor, 
and if you get a capacitor, you just connect them with each other with any initial condition that you want, the output is going to be a sinusoid. And the frequency of the sinusoid is given by, guess what, that square root of LC. So the same value that was giving you the resonance frequency, that's the same that is actually the resonance frequency. In fact, that's what's called resonance. And at resonance, something fascinating is happening. The energy fluctuates back and forth between the inductor and the capacitor. Inductor takes the energy, half a cycle. Capacitor gives it away, the other half. Okay? And no energy is lost. It's beautiful. So you can say, hold on, we're done. Yay. Okay. Yes, but a bit of a detail here. Inductors and capacitors have resistors, not because you add them, because they kind of do. The wires, wires have resistances. The minute you have resistances, guess what? That resonance dies. So if the resistance is small, it's going to last for a while, but it dies. Nobody wants to have a phone that works in a millisecond, right? You want to have a phone that you can watch a YouTube video for a solid 10 hours, right? So how do we do that? We have to find a creative way to remove the effect of this loss. All right, R is loss, R is bad, compensate for it. The trick here is that R takes energy in each cycle, find a way to inject energy by the same exact amount in that cycle. All right. And without going through why these circuits do that, these circuits, that are called self-sustained oscillators, happen to just play that trick. So they have this marvelous property that they would exactly inject the same amount of energy into the LC that is being lost by the resistor. It's fascinating. And the reason that I'm not covering in much more detail, because a much more detailed analysis requires a bit of nonlinear things, and I think nonlinear things are bad, so let's just keep it easy and linear for now, okay? But again, I'm showing you something that's in all of your phones. So in all of your phones, the oscillators that I use are these, really. No joke. All right, one last thing and we're done with what's in your cell phone. We need to do multiply two signals, right? How do I multiply two signals? That's a tough one. This is called a uh, multiplier problem. Now, if you have an LTI system, linear time invariant systems, you cannot multiply things. You can just add them. All right. So multiplication is either in a linear process or it's a time variant process. So it requires a little bit more than what you've read in your courses so far. But I'm going to show you a very specific example that I can emulate multiplication in a special case that happens to be a very important case. And that is a switch. We all know what a switch is. So a switch is a circuit block that either makes a connection between two nodes or it doesn't. So in this particular case, I am saying that a switch is controlled by a control voltage, V control. If V control is negative, the switch is open. It doesn't make the connection. And if V control is positive, it creates a short. That's it. Okay, so here's an example of a circuit. On the left-hand side, I'm showing a switch that is open. So V out is equal to zero. On the right-hand side, the switch is closed. So V out is equal to V in, right? Okay, so let's talk about a very complicated scenario. In the previous example, let's suppose that your input voltage is the one that I'm showing in blue. And the control voltage, let's assume it's the one in the red. We decided that if the control voltage was positive, input is equal to the output, right? So in the portions that the sinusoid is positive, input and output are the same. And in the portions that the oscillator is frequent and the oscillation amplitude is negative, I get zero at the output. So I get this choppy waveform at the output, which doesn't mean much right now, right? It's just a random thing, it seems. Okay, but 
it is as equivalent of performing this math function. So the previous function, it's as if I am multiplying my input signal with a square wave of 0 and 1, right? Mathematically are the same. Sounds good? Now, the reason I did this is because I know how to mathematically analyze this by using your favorite math concept, Fourier series. Yeah, some of these things become useful, I know. We never expect them to ever come back and haunt us, and they just do. So, that Fourier series thing that we saw before in our classes, what did it say? It said that if I have a periodic waveform, it can be always expanded at a summation of sinusoids, and that's it. So that square wave, which is a periodic waveform, can be expanded using this series, all right? You can, if you are really interested tonight, just go home and derive the Fourier series coefficient, see if you get this. You know, you may get it right and check if my answer is correct. I think I'm right, but this is what you get. Now, I'm going to multiply my signal with this Fourier series thing. All right, don't get intimidated. So for P of T, I put the Fourier series and I multiply by V in of T. All right, it's just the math. So each term multiplies by V in of T as I get, right? What was the objective of my transmitter to get my information signal and multiplying by cosine of omega t, right? Good news is that I got that. That's a desired multiplication in the middle term. Bad news is that I got a whole bunch of other terms, right? But if you notice, the wave at those frequency, at those on terms has different frequency. What is the frequency? 3 omega, 5 omega, right? If I don't like something in RF, what do I do with it? Keyword? I filter it. How do I filter it? Using? Bandpass filters. RF designers. Thank you. Mission accomplished. That's exactly the schematic of a mixer that is used in all of your phones, by the way. So we get a transistor that converts the voltage to current. We already knew that. That's my switch. Yay, I can have a switch. And then I put an LC to have a resonance, all right? Congratulations, you just graduated an RF class. So you literally know how to build an RF transmitter at this point, and I'm not exaggerating. The rest of it is important details, but there are details. The concept is exactly as I showed you. Sounds good, you all feel good about yourselves? What's in your cell phone? Go and brag to your friends at home now. All right, so in summary, RF circuits utilize the concept of resonance quite a bit. All right, as you can see, they come everywhere in from filtering to oscillators to amplifiers. We use it quite a bit. Good news, RF circuits are not complex. We're not dealing with a billion transistors. We're dealing with a handful. All right, even if they have a lot of transistors, the key ones are very few, okay? But if I want to tell you the truth, modern RF systems are a bit more complex than the ones that I showed you because they use a lot of different analog and digital techniques. In fact, digital techniques are so powerful that we try to use as much of it as we can in our RF design. Okay? And as you might expect, there are a lot of details that I missed. I didn't cover noise at all. And you probably know from the previous lecture, noise plays a big issue, right? If your signal is small, how do I get it out of the noise, right? We didn't talk about that. On the other hand, if the signals are very large, the system cannot be linear anymore. How do I deal with those? So these are important issues that are casually skipped. Great news for you. Become a good RFIC designer, you get paid a lot of money. So if that's an objective for you, that's a good career path. Thank you all.